<coughs> As I was trying to find the mind of God for this morning's service, it seemed as if the Lord just began to lay upon my heart with all the challenges that we face. <coughs> we need to come back to basics. We need to understand that the power is found in the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to read all of these verses today. Those are the verses we'll use for our text. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him, Him being Jesus, to reconcile all things to Himself by Jesus, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. In our text, the phrase for the text, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I'd like to ask my wife if she would stand and pray for the message this morning. Father, that in Jesus all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself by Jesus, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. I was looking this week and uh, looking at some illustrations regarding the blood of Christ. And I came across the candy cane. We, we talk about that at Christmas. But I came across the illustration of the candy cane. A candy maker years ago in the state of Indiana made it. And I, I thought it was interesting and thought I would just share it with you again. I'm sure most of you have heard the uh, object lesson of the candy cane. Now, that's what, the, that's what we call it today, candy cane. It's nothing more than a secular piece of candy that most people don't want until Christmas and then they only want one unless they really love peppermint. <clears throat> the pure white stick stood for the virgin birth and the sinless nature of Christ. And the fact that the stick was hard candy signified the rock-solid foundation of the church. <coughs> and it's also made, <coughs> excuse me, in the form of a J for the first letter of Jesus' name. And if you turn it upside down, it's in the form of a staff where Jesus came and rescued the lost sheep. And on the candy cane, there are three small stripes. The original uh, candy cane were three small stripes which stood for the suffering of Jesus. And the large stripe which stood for the blood of Christ. And when I think to myself of... Uh, just the very nature of the culture in which we live today. A nature of the culture is, let's take the easy way out. Let's don't offend anyone. Let's just try to make everything a man-made utopia. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought to myself, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ is not going to be any more popular than it has been for a very, very long time to come. Because we live in a world now that says, why would you talk about an old rugged cross? Why would you talk about somebody having to die on an old rugged cross? That's a bloody religion. 
nobody, nobody really wants that sort of stuff. We want to, to bring everybody together. We're not trying to talk about violence. But you know, we live in a world of violence, don't we? While we're trying to make a man-made utopia, it leads to selfishness, and selfishness leads to violence, and selfishness leads to all the things that we see around us today. And so when I was thinking about the blood of Jesus, someone asked a question to me one time, and it made me have to consider. I don't have the entire scriptural answer here, but I, I brought part of it today. First of all, why did it take blood to satisfy God's justice? That's, that's a legitimate question because I, I've had people who didn't know the Lord and they had a, a mild personality and they abhorred violence and they kind of looked at God as a violent God. I said, why? Well, what, why would God demand blood to satisfy His justice? I don't understand that. And, uh, you know, I think we would be wise to search the Scriptures and not resent people's questions. Amen? We would be wise to say, you know what? God has an answer. Oh, it may not. We're not looking to give people answers that will necessarily uh, make them happy, but we want them to understand the truth of why God has done what He has done. The, the first thing I want to share with you, and this is the main answer to why did it take blood to satisfy God's justice, is because life is only found in the blood. Now you remember when God told Adam and Eve, He gave them e eternal life, but He also gave them a choice. He said, you will live forever, but He said, you can eat of every tree of the, of the garden except for the tree that is in the center, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And He said, the day that you eat thereof, He said, you shall die. The death process will begin. Everything about God is life. But everything about sin begins with death. Immediately, when Eve and Adam and Eve said, we're going to think from a different perspective other than what God has given us, the death process began in their bodies, in their spirits, in their lives. They went from, from being up here to, to a downward spiral. I find it interesting when I, when I read through the Old Testament how that... As, as men begin to, to live, they would live for hundreds of years. And Methuselah lived for what? 969 years. And then there were others that lived for 800 and 700. But I do notice that as the curse of death began to get worse, man's lifespan began to get shorter. Because what does death do? Its only ultimate goal is to snuff out life ultimately. That's eventually what death does. You know, my, my father... I used to hear him make a statement sometimes. He said, we leap from the cradle and we run towards the grave. And how true that is. And hopefully a lot of nice things happen in between. But you know, when it comes to this life, if the only thing we're living for is this life, this life is really based in death. Because God said, the moment you eat of the tree, the process of death will begin in you. But we need to understand, first of all, looking in Genesis 9 and, 9 and 4, why God demanded blood sacrifice. In Genesis 9 and 4, He said, You shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. In other words, He was telling the, the, the people in Genesis, He said, when you cook flesh, he, Noah, He said, do not cook it in its own blood, because the blood is the life of that animal. That's an interesting concept. And then over in Leviticus chapter 17, Verses 10 and 11, he said, And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood. I will cut him off. And we've jumped ahead a little bit. And then he says, Why? For the life of the flesh is in what? The blood. And I have given it to you to do what? To make atonement for your souls. Now in the Old Testament, you know, he was, he was uh, causing them to sacrifice animals and pigeons and rams and, and sheep and turtle doves and all of these things because the life was the blood of that animal that had to be shed. And he was giving us a symbolic statement that there was going to come a day when while a pigeon would sacrifice for one year's atonement, 
or a ram or, or a turtle dove or an oxen next year, you had to do it all over again because there wasn't eternal life in the blood of an animal. But it did signify the fact that one day there would come a man named Christ Jesus who not only had the blood of a man in him, but he had the blood of Emmanuel's veins. He had the blood of divinity flowing through his veins and his blood would not only only need to be offered once, but it would be good enough for the entire world. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. This is why God's justice demanded blood. Because sin brought death. And He said, the only way I can reverse that is through the blood, which is life. And we see symbolically thousands and thousands, and Bill and I have talked about this sometimes, about how many thousands of oxen and all the sacrifices that they made. It was symbolic of the fact that life was needed to overcome the death that had been brought about by sin. Life is only found in the blood. I want you to notice, secondly, that God made the first blood covering in the Garden of Eden. Because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, He said, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin, and He clothed them. What was Adam and Eve's first response whenever they had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It was to go take some fig leaves, some leaves of trees, and to cover up because all of a sudden they knew that they were naked. But you know, man has a, has a wrong concept. You know, man says, all I need is to turn over a new leaf. <laughs> no pun intended. All i got to do is turn over a new leaf to start my life over. All i got to do is just, just uh, uh, get a new therapist. All I've got to do is just, uh, just kind of uh, change my lifestyle. Maybe get a better job, a new wife. Maybe all I need is just to do... And all that is, is man's effort to try to, to put salve on an amputation. Because the problem is sin and man's ability to cover sin will never, ever work. There's no life. There's no eternal life. There's no, there's no nothing found in anything other than the blood. And so you know what God did? He went out and He made the first sacrifice. He killed the first animal or animals. And He made tunics of skin out of them. He shed the blood... This is symbolic, but He shed the blood of those animals so Adam and Eve's shame, their nakedness, could be covered up. God made the first blood covering in the Garden of Eden. But then God accepted the first offering for sin from a slain animal. Because Abel and Cain, Cain was a tiller of the field, and he brought an offering before God of, of the first fruits of, of, of his... Uh, of his uh, gleanings from the field. And Abel brought a, a lamb. He was a keeper of sheep, the Bible says. And he brought a lamb with the fat from that and the blood from that. And he offered it to God. And God said a very strange thing. The Lord respected Abel and his offering, but He did not respect Cain and his offering. Why not? Didn't both men come with a motive to try to worship you, Lord? Didn't they both come? There was only one reason why they came. It was because that Adam and Eve had taught their boys, we need to seek God's forgiveness because we sinned against Him in the garden. They came to offer God not a praise offering, <coughs> which would have been uh, somewhat acceptable in the Old Testament with fruit and with wheat and with other things you could bring. But when it was a sin offering, there was only one thing you could bring. And that was you had to shed the blood of a pure, spotless animal. One that was not crippled and one that was not maimed. You had to bring the blood. Because what are we talking about again? The life is only found in the blood. The only thing that God said could counteract death in our, in our souls was the blood. In the Old Testament, Jesus was not yet there. But God had given them something to keep before their minds and their eyes constantly on a regular basis. That blood has to be shed for my sins to be forgiven. The Israelites understood this full well. That's why God did not accept Cain's offering because Cain did not bring a blood offering for the forgiveness of his sins. There was no forgiveness for sins in a good crop. There's only forgiveness for sins in the blood. 
That is, my friend, why it takes blood to satisfy God's justice. But I want us to move to our our scripture, first or Colossians 1, 19 through 23. And I want us to kind of begin to go through this just a little bit and understand what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for us. First of all, I would share with you that the righteousness of Christ's blood, what made it righteous? What made it righteous is found in verse 19. For it said, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. Does righteousness dwell on the earth? No. Righteousness emanates from heaven. And in heaven, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit got together and they said, we are going to make a once for all righteous sacrifice. You know, there, there was, if there was enough righteousness in the blood of the rams and, and, and the cows and all that was sacrificed, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to come, but only righteousness could only be found in the blood of Christ. It couldn't be found in the blood of all these other things. You know, if, if we are seeking righteousness for our soul's need in anything else to begin with other than the blood of Jesus Christ, we will never find that it pleases God. Your church membership, your participation in religious activities, even getting baptized, whatever it is, that is not what brings us into favor before God. What brings us into favor before God is when we show respect to the righteousness of the blood of Jesus Christ. It pleased God that in Jesus all the fullness should dwell. First of all, I share with you that He was the only one worthy to satisfy God's justice. Because in Romans 5.17 it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned, much more those who receive abundant grace and the gift of righteousness, where did that come from? Will reign in life through who? The One, Jesus Christ. If you and I want to experience real righteousness, we have to be saved by the only One whose blood was worthy to satisfy the justice of Almighty God. And that was His own Son, Jesus Christ. You know, there's some people that think, you know, I have to, I have to punish myself. I have to uh, do good deeds. Uh, I've seen some very amusing and amazing things and sad things, really. But I've seen one guy who they would sprinkle sharp, ob sharp objects, whether it was glass and gravel or whatever, and he would crawl on his knees to Mecca and go many miles. By the time he got there, I mean, he just, he was a mess. When I stop and think about that, he was trying to satisfy the justice of God with his own blood. He was saying, I'll work my way, I'll punish myself. I've known of, of people in medieval times who would flog themselves because that was a sign of penance. That was a sign, and the blood would flow. But you know, the flowing of our blood does not satisfy the justice of God. In Jesus Christ alone, He's the only one worthy to satisfy the justice of God, which means we can lean on Him. We don't have to go through that terrible punishment because He's already taken our place. Praise God. Not only was He the only one worthy to satisfy God's justice, but He's the only sacrifice who could redeem all of us. Let's quote it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. That's the God who gave and shed His blood for us so that not just our church could be saved, but so that we could go out to redeem all of Salem and all of Beloit and all of Sebring and all of the world. Hallelujah. Can you imagine what it must have been like in the families of Israel when it would come time for the, the Passover, when it would come time for the sacrifices and they would say, oh, do, do we have a lamb that, that, that has not uh, got a blemish or does not have a broken leg or doesn't have part of its uh, wool ripped out? Do, do we have what we need? Do... Oh, the, the worry, the concern that devout Jews used to go through. Oh, we've got to sacrifice to God. We've got to make atonement for our sins. 
Friends, I don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that from year to year. We can come to Jesus. He was the perfect Lamb. He was given one time. And He, thank God, is enough for everybody. Amen. Hallelujah. Because Christ's blood is righteous. I think of John Wesley coming home one night and he was robbed. The fellow got a little bit of money and a lot of Christian literature. And the robber was not very happy. And he said, don't you have any more money? And John Wesley, nervous and unnerved and his horse skittish, he said, no, I, I have no more money. And the man began to run off and then John Wesley said, wait just a moment, I have one more thing for you. And the robber turned around and came back. <coughs> we don't do that in today's world, do we? He said, you may live to regret the life that you're living right now. And I have one more thing for you. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And the man turned in disgust and ran into the night. A few years later, John Wesley was preaching in another part of England. And a well-dressed man came up to him. John Wesley did not recognize him. It was at night when he was robbed. And the man said, I'm the man who robbed you. A little bit too joyous for that. He said, God has forgiven me. He said, I own my own business now. He said, and I owe it all to you. John Wesley said, no, no, my friend. You owe it all to the blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed you from all sin. Amen. And you know, that's who we owe it all to this morning. To the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to move from the righteousness of Christ's blood to the reconciliation found in the blood. Because in verse 20, he says, and by Him, Him being Jesus, to reconcile all things to God. Hallelujah. The amazing thing is that you can't work hard enough. You can't uh, do enough good deeds to satisfy the justice of God. You just have to go through Jesus Christ and say, tell the Father, I'm sorry I've offended His holiness. And Jesus is the attorney that pleads our case and He always wins. God has a soft spot for Jesus because He paid the right price for our sins. Hallelujah. Whenever I think about reconciliation, I think first of all of the fact that He's reconciled my heart because He says old things have passed away and behold all things have come new and I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus this morning. God has changed my heart. He told the Israelites in one place, He said, I'll take out a heart of stone and I will put in a heart of flesh. God has a way of redeeming our hearts. That's the first thing that He redeems. He comes to us and He changes our hearts. And that is what we need this morning. Some people need a change of heart. You don't just need a change of scenery or circumstances or financial prosperity. You need a change of heart this morning. Because it can only be found in the blood of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the one who reconciles our hearts back to the loving heart of the Father. He reconciles our minds. He tells us that uh, we are also to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. He says, don't be conformed to the spirit of this world. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is one of the things we talk about in our Bible study on Monday nights. We talk about how when we get saved, God can change our hearts in an instant. We go on our way and then all of a sudden we find sometimes that our mind is in conflict with what's in our heart. Because we have old habits and we have old ways of thinking. And God the Holy Spirit says, let me transform your mind, my friend. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ does for us as well. He reconciles not only our hearts back to God. He reconciles our minds to God. We can begin to think like God. Think like Jesus. That's the plan of the Father. And then thank God, my friends, there's coming a day when He's going to reconcile our old bodies. There's coming a day when while we, we can't avoid the penalty of death in our bodies, our hearts can be redeemed, our minds can be restored, our souls can be in, in right fellowship with God. But there's coming a day when there's going to be slow singing and, and, and a lot of mourning at our funerals, everyone here. I'm not much on statistics, but one that does interest me is one out of every one dies. Pretty solid. Yeah. It's never failed. That's why funeral homes don't go out of business. Because we all have a date with death. But then, my friends, there's coming a day when it says the dead in Christ shall rise. 
And we shall meet Him in the air. And our bodies are going to be redeemed and glorified. We're going to be in a glorious place with a glorified Christ. Our bodies will be like His body. Hallelujah. The only reminder of the sin that is in this world, that exists in heaven, is the scars you find in the hands and the feet and the side of Jesus and on His precious brow. But I have good news for you this morning. God is in the business of reconciling our hearts and our minds and someday, thank God, our bodies to that perfect state from which we fell. Aren't you glad that the blood of Jesus Christ <coughs> reconciles us this morning? Then I think of the reach of the blood of Jesus. And he speaks of it here also in verse 20. He said that this blood would not only reconcile things to himself, but he said, here's how inclusive it is. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. Wow. And then I'm reminded where I read in Revelation where he said, I'm going to make a new heaven and I'm going to make a new earth. You know, someday, he, he says in one place, and I was reading it here not, not too long ago, he said that the former things will be remembered no more. I can't imagine forgetting the beauty and splendor of the Grand Canyon. I can't imagine forgetting a beautiful field full of corn waving gently in, in the sunshine and the breezes of the day. I can't imagine uh, forgetting the beauty of so many things that I have seen. But my God tells me that the blood of Jesus Christ is so powerful that it's made arrangements that even God is not only going to be able to redeem us, He's going to make this earth new and He's going to make the heavens new and it's going to be beyond anything that you and I could ever even begin to imagine or think. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that excites me this morning. Right. Amen. And you know what it all comes from? It comes because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you and was shed for me. Hallelujah. I praise God for the blood this morning. The blood that transforms. The blood. That is our next point. The radical transformation of the blood of Jesus. This is interesting. He said, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. I did a little comparison just from these two verses here. The first comparison in verse 21 is He says that we were aliens. And then in verse 22 He says we're going to be presented holy. We were at opposites with God. We were alienated from God. And he says, now the blood of Jesus Christ makes us holy. But then secondly, not only that, I see that one time we were enemies. But then he said he's going to present us blameless. What makes us an enemy of God? Sin in our lives. That's what makes us God's enemy. Whenever we allow sin to reign, but the blood of Jesus Christ comes in and it makes a radical transformation in the lives and the hearts of everyone who accepts Jesus. We go from being enemies to being standing blameless before God. Hallelujah. But then he says we had corrupt minds. But we're going to be presented to God as above reproach someday. You know, there's some people who if the veil of their mind could be put up on this PowerPoint screen, we would all be gasping. And some would say, while I'm gasping at there, what's in their mind, I hope I'm not next. But you know what, my friends, as a child of God, the blood of Jesus Christ takes a corrupt mind and He wants to give us a mind that is above reproach when we stand before God. But then the last thing that I see in this radical transformation is that we were full of wicked deeds, but He says someday we're going to be presented, accepted by God. Above reproach in His sight. Hallelujah. You know, it's one thing what people think of you. It's one thing how people view you, but when you stand before God and he, His smile of approval is upon you, there's nothing like it in the world or anywhere else. Because the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me was when the blood of Jesus Christ took all my wicked deeds and covered them up. And I could feel the smile of God and say, you're living above reproach because of the blood of my Son. Don't you love the blood of Jesus? <clears throat> Let's be thankful for it. Let's rejoice in the fact that it covers every sin. I also think of a young woman who was saved 
She had been an alcoholic, a drug addict, and she had been involved in prostitution. This story really took place in a distant state. She got saved and changes began to take place in her life and she was in discipleship and she began to grow and then she began to teach the children in the church. Her growth became so evident. And uh, she kind of caught the pastor's son's eye and they developed a relationship and before long, a year or two, wedding plans began to be known. There was an engagement. The church kind of took a little bit of a different stance one group in the church was excited and thrilled for the young couple. Another group in the church was very concerned. And they said, you know, we're just not sure about this woman's past. We're just very concerned about it. Pastor, son, you, you, what they were really saying was you can do better. You need to find a girl that's not been involved in all of this stuff. And it got so serious that they had to have a meeting in the church. And when that meeting was held, Things were said back and forth. It began to be heated. There was not much agreement. And finally the pastor's son stood up in the meeting. He wasn't chairing it. And with tears in his eyes, he said, I must say something to all of us. He said, my fiancé's past is not really what is on trial here today. He said, the blood of Jesus Christ is what is on trial here today. He said, either we believe that the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse my fiancé from all sin, or we don't. The story goes that some on this side were smitten in their hearts. They were good people. They were just looking at it from a wrong perspective. You know what? We've got to get our eyes off the past of people, and we've got to realize that they've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, and they can be redeemed. Think of ourselves. Think of our own life. Where have we been? Where could we have been if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ? It makes a radical transformation in our lives. Hallelujah. And in closing, the route we follow because of the blood of Jesus. I also find it here. First of all, it's a route of ever-growing faith. It comes in a bit of a negative light he says, if indeed you continue in the faith. You know, we've got to keep on loving Jesus on purpose. We don't coast to heaven, amen? We don't coast to heaven. We have to continue to be obedient. We have to continue to allow the blood of Jesus Christ to cover every sin. There's times when we have to put something back under the blood. There's times when we have to confess to God. But I want to tell you, I'm so thankful that God has made a plan through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, that our faith doesn't have to just kind of hold on to Jesus comes kind of mentality, but it can continue to grow because He said we need to continue in the faith. If you really have faith in the God of the Bible, you will not live in fear of everything that's going on in the world. Because the stronger your faith, the more you realize that even if the world kills our bodies, it can't touch our souls, and we are under the protection of the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Hallelujah. Because the route the blood has paved for us is a route of ever-growing faith. Let us continue in the faith. But it's a route of an ever-deeper walk with God. Because He also said, being grounded and steadfast. Do not allow Satan to have your faith. Do not allow Satan to shake your determination. I'm going through with God. Because that's what it's going to take, my friend. Satan will not make it easy for you to get to heaven. He will not make it easy for you to become a mature Christian. He's going to fight you. He's going to battle you every step of the way. But the good news is this. The blood of Jesus has provided a grounding and a steadfastness that we can develop in our walk with Him that where we don't have to be driven by every wave that comes along. Thank God for the power that I find in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's an ever deeper walk with God. But then lastly, it's an ever increasing hope. Because in verse 23 it says, And we have not moved away from God, the hope of the gospel which you heard. You know what I find in a world that says, it's all about me and doing whatever I want? You know what that leads to? Pessimism. 
All you got to do is some, see some of the television programs. Life After People. Nostradamus 2012. You know what we see in the world today? Global warming. You know what I see in the world today? An impending pessimism. They don't even realize what it comes from. But it comes from a life that is given over to selfishness. That is given over to the ways of the devil. But you know what God's people's attitude should be? One of continuing hope. I know that this world seems to be crumbling and earthquakes are happening and, and hurricanes going on right now in New York City and New Jersey. And my friends, I'm hoping in the gospel that was given to the once and for all to the saints and I'm going to hold on to that. That's what's getting me through. Do you believe that this morning? I want to challenge you. You can hang on to that. While the world is on fire, the Word of God, my friend, will still be standing. Why? Because the blood was shed. The life is in the blood. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ is there for you and me. It can get us through every battle. It can take us through things that people give up on. It can give us hope when everybody says hope is dead because there's always hope in the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. I give you this illustration in closing. During a medieval war, there was a Muslim army during the Crusades that went into a city who had capitulated with the Christian army, with the Crusaders. And there was a Muslim commander who said, I vow to slay every citizen in this town. And it had been formerly a Muslim town. You had to take sides in those days. And as he came down into the town, he began to keep his word. Crusaders had withdrawn, but the Muslim army went through and began to kill every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. It was a gruesome thing. And one of the houses where the soldiers went in, they began to run into, have we been to this house? Have we been to that house? And so another soldier said, I know what I'll do. And he dipped a rag in the pool of blood all over the houses from the victims they had just slain. And he wiped it on the door and he said, now we'll know we've already been here. Well, there was a fugitive who was watching from a secret place and he saw what that soldier did and he ran to his house, which they had not yet arrived at, and he had a little precious lamb in his yard that he loved and he slit that lamb's throat and he began to soak all the rags he could find in that lamb's blood. He hid the body of the lamb and he wiped the, the rag on the door so the blood could be plainly seen. And when the soldiers came, they said, we've already been here. Let's not mess with this one. And this man was in hiding in the basement of his house with his family. And he was spared. What a tragic story. But yet, what a story of how the fact that the death angel someday is coming to every one of us. And he's going to have the sword in his hand. He's going to say, I want my price. I want the people that belong to me. But if the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ is shed on the doorpost of our hearts as it was in Egypt before they left when the first Passover was performed, my friends, the death angel is going to have to pass on by. We don't have to suffer the death of eternal, to, eternal death. We don't have to suffer the death of eternal punishment because the blood is on the door of our soul. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know about you this morning. But I just feel a special unction. I feel a special anointing in my spirit right now because I'm preaching about the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching about that blood that was shed a little over 2,000 years ago on an old rugged cross and it still has just the same power that it had back then. It has the power to redeem. It has the power to sanctify. It has the power to cleanse because it is divine blood and the life is in the blood. It's not just the life of an animal. It's not just the life of a man. It's the life of the God-man. That's why if one drop of Jesus' blood can touch the sin in a person's heart, He can cleanse them. He can change them. He can give them a brand new life. Because it's the blood of Jesus. I'd like for us all to stand this morning. Brian, could you come and play some song? I just feel like the Holy Spirit is here today. I feel like maybe there's someone here this morning who you need the blood of Jesus Christ applied. My friends, this is, this is what we proclaim without apology. Forgiveness is not found 
and bigger and better churches and greater programs and more people. It's found in the blood. It's found in the blood. And while Brian plays this morning, if there's someone who needs to pray, these front seats are open. I believe that the Holy Spirit is dealing with one or more hearts here today. I don't know who you are, but I just feel in my spirit that God is here. And I want us to wait just a few minutes here this morning. My friend, I tell you, the blood of Jesus Christ is able to wipe your past clean. He's able to keep you clean today, and He's able to keep you clean in the future. Your good intentions, as wonderful as they may be, they are not enough. But if you'll just let the blood of Jesus Christ cover every sin, you can make it. You can get through. You can have a deeper walk with God. You can have an ever-increasing faith. You can have an ever-increasing hope. Would you please consider seriously what God is saying to you right now? And if you need to pray, I invite you to come forward. Father in heaven, pray right now that the blood of Jesus Christ would be poured out for us in this service. We pray right now that the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, would be applied to a heart that is in need. Lord, that one who has tried therapy, that one who's tried pleasures, that one who's tried more money to find happiness, Lord, please help them to come to Jesus Christ. Lord, we can't find help in a bottle. We can't find help in all the things that the world says will work. We can only find the satisfaction for our souls when we allow the blood to cover our sins. So, Father, we pray right now that in this next moments together that you will speak strongly to that heart and they will respond to you. For, dear Jesus, it's because of the blood. While Brian plays, would you come if you need to pray? I feel the Holy Spirit here right now. He's here right now. He's, he's brought us all here today for a purpose. This was not an accident. There's a divine design right here for this moment in time. The Lord is speaking to your heart, my dear friend. He loves you. Congregation to preach to you. Brother Wayne, would you dismiss his